Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. This is the Band Books Podcast, episode 104. And usually, most of the time, when we're functional, mm-hmm. we are your hosts, Christopher Gillespie. Dylan Willen, Maxson, relaxing, as always. And I, as always, and I, as always again, am Donovan Riley. I mixed uh, four stigmatic mushroom coffee with espresso this morning, and so now I can taste color. Which which four stigmatic do you use? Uh, it's called Four Stigmatic. That's the actual company. Yeah. Which which uh, use their mushroom coffee blend? Yeah, the thing. The yeah, mushroom coffee blend. Yep. Okay. With the arabica. Because the other one uh, that my wife likes, I think, tastes like an old shoe. There's a whole bunch of different ones. Like they try to say it targets different brands. There are many. When I when we first started buying from them, when I first just I heard about them, I think from somebody I train with or, or somebody at the UFC. I tried it and I was really impressed. There was they had cocoa and coffee. They had a box mm-hmm. of each, mm-hmm. and now they've got a whole page of different choices. So this this is not the mushroom elixir. This is the mushroom coffee mix. Mushroom coffee mix, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and for those of you who, uh, it's it's a nootropic. It's chaga root and redolian root and lion's mane and arabica coffee. And I can testify that it, it works. It works really, really well. Unless you mix it with espresso, in which case, wear a seatbelt. Yeah, it doesn't have caffeine, but it's the neurotransmitter stuff, right? Yeah, for sure. About 20 minutes after I finished my coffee, I said to Annie that I felt like I took two asthma inhalers to the nostrils at full blast. <laughs> <laughs> like there was a draft going through my ears. My my sinuses were so open. So I'm glad I've calmed down a little bit since then for this podcast. All right. But last week or the past two episodes, we talked about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Costa Discipleship, and we covered quite a bit of context around Bonhoeffer and his life and uh, his involvement with Karl Barth and the Barman Declaration and that movement. And also then, of course, inevitably, the effects, the consequences of National Socialism, the Mm -hmm. Nazis, as they're called, on Bonhoeffer and his ultimate hanging in 1945. He was imprisoned and hung. And some of the, we kind of alluded to some of the debates, talked a little bit about some of the debates about whether he was a martyr or not and everything that goes with it. And, but we also mentioned then that a contemporary of Bonhoeffer, another Wunderkind, mm-hmm. uh, was a man named Hermann Saze. And Hermann Saze, quick and dirty, was a Lutheran theologian. He taught at Erlangen in Germany. And he was there during the war. He refused to join the Nazi party to wear a brown shirt, as they were called. Right. And he did not, he refused to be a card carrying member of the Nazi party. But because of his relationship with the president of the university, he had some protection. Yet, as a consequence of this, he was always under surveillance by the SS. He was always on a watch list. He was always, always being threatened with being imprisoned and disappeared. But he made it through the war in Germany. But he did make it through the war. And he served in World War I in the trenches, right? Uh, he was born in 1895. I'm pretty sure he suffered, uh, we call it post-traumatic stress disorder, or post-traumatic stress now, sorry, veterans. Drop the disorder part. Uh, at that time, it was called shell shock. But I think, if, at the very least, I know he served in the trenches. Hmm. He was ordained th- in 1920, so okay. the timeline kind of works out. I can't remember for sure, and I know a lot about Herman Saze because I love him, but I cannot remember that part for some reason right now. Anyways, I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I think I, he would have been too young. Yeah. Eh, he might have been 16, 17 at that point. Yeah. Maybe he didn't. Hmm. I can't remember. Bon but Hooper he certainly didn't. lived through it. He lived through it. Yeah. And so there's the influence of that. And as I mentioned, the, polit- the German politicians surrendered at Versailles in 1918. The German military did not surrender, and they took it as a great personal insult that the politicians surrendered. Mm -hmm. And that really was the seeds because Hitler was also in the military at that time and he served on the front lines. And it really did eventually become and blossom into the National Socialist Party in Germany, Hitler's party and the Nazis. And that's why, as I noted, that a lot of those Prussian politicians were assassinated and executed by the German, by the Nazis when they took over as kind of revenge for that. And... So Saze and Bonhoeffer and others who had lived through that time, and especially the 20s, and of course you had a worldwide depression, and Berlin was essentially Tijuana and Las Vegas and Bangkok, (laughs) Thailand, all rolled up into one during the 20s. It was 
It was the armpit of hell. It was a wild and crazy place. It was super wild. There's a show on Netflix called uh, Berlin Babylon. Oh. Which actually captures the feel of Berlin in the 20s pretty well, pretty accurately. Huh. It's not a show for everybody. I'll tell you that right now. It's, it's technically about a, a detective trying to solve a murder, but set against Berlin in the 1920s. So it's a lot of underworld stuff and it's a lot of perversion and uh what's the word um epicureanism there we go got it yeah Epicure epicurean kind of, of society and chaos but if you're not afraid of the darker side of humanity maybe it's for you <laughs> right yeah if you don't have if you have a low anthropology you probably don't have a problem with the show but the point <laughs> being is that so in germany you have guys like bonhoeffer saze and others who not only live through the first world war and that experience but then have to live through germany in the 20s and the depression and then the rise of socialism and that was one of the reasons that hitler did actually come to power is because he basically turned the economy around hmm. and he started companies like volkswagen and fanta by the way fanta pop nazis <laughs> oh and what was the other one the razors uh gillette uh, I don't think it was gillette no. that's american yeah <laughs> whatever the german one. bosch maybe but anyways hitler basically just kind of said to a lot of of folks, you know, uh, entrepreneurs and so forth, industrialists, hey, let's get the economy kickstarted. Let's start opening factories and manufacturing our own cars and our own planes and our right. own uh, farm utensils and everything. And that really kickstarted the economy. And as we in the United States know, if a politician can kickstart the economy, it makes everybody kind of happy. And it's a good way to get popular uh, support. But also dealt with a lot of the... Um uh, issues, you know, so societal mm -hmm. or, or sociological ones. Right, so right. You're talking about, uh, you know, the all the mental institutions were ill managed and right. So cleaning up, as we the language we use, you know, clean up the city or clean up the right. He did, institutions. yeah. Cleaned up the mental institutions, cleaned up public education, on cleaned up the society. And like I said, in the 20s, Berlin and Germany severely economically depressed because of the the punishment meted out at Versailles in 1918, mm -hmm. but also then just that Epicurean, just lascivious, licentious society that took root, Hitler came in and cleaned it up yeah. and said, we're, you know, we're getting rid of the gambling dens, we're getting rid of the prostitution, we're getting rid of the pornographers, we're getting rid of the drugs, we're getting rid of all of it. And people said, thank God, finally someone's going to step up and fix this problem. Well, isn't there, I mean, I heard it referred to this way, that you know, the extremes of, you know, totalitarianism, you know, it's on either the right or the left. Yeah, right. Right. I mean, it can be this kind of nationalistic party. Um, right. Is a very kind of conservative version of it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the the other side of it is just like complete licentiousness, which is another right, hyper liberalism of, or hyper right, we call it progressivism nowadays. Yeah, hyper progressive. That's right. And it, but either way, it's, it's basically telling you how you have to live. <laughs> right, because as I think I've said on this show before, my professor, Stephen Paulson, who some listeners are familiar with, said, idealists make the best dictators. Yeah. Because in order to realize my idea, you're either with it or you're against it. And if you're against it, we're going to dehumanize you and isolate you, and you are the problem. Right, and there's a way of turning some kind of mm, ideal, even a really positive one, you know, like mm -hmm. cleaning up, you know, the situation, uh, increasing right. morality, that kind of thing. Right. Uh, turning it into really a terror. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you think of of uh, groups that want to establish a pure communistic communal mm -hmm. society, a community, and so they'll move to the steppes of Russia or they'll move to Alaska. Like uh, my friend's ex-wife, her grandmother came over here from Russia and settled in Russia. They were a literal communist commune. Wow. And it lasted about a decade before yeah. the leaders either checked out or passed away and then the next generation went yeah this ain't working for us oh i was thinking of also i, I know this from the uh, birthing community but there's uh, the farm down in tennessee it was yeah. it was a christian communist kind of sure. setup but these idealistic communities or these idealistic movements that spring up with these groups uh, usually sectarian in, mm -hmm. in nature because they're breaking away from some sort of orthodox group and saying, no, we can do this better. Mm. We have the perfect ideal. We have this, again, this platonic ideal in our mind of the perfect society or the perfect government or the perfect whatever. And if you would just get on board, <laughs> we can make this a reality. That's why you have William Penn settling in what's now Pennsylvania. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Moving out in the woods or you have the Mennonites moving to Montana and so forth. And so Saze and Bonhoeffer, like I said, and others, they grew up in this world of war, but then lasciviousness and chaos. 
and then the rise of the National Socialist Party, and then all of these contemporaries and colleagues of Sazé and Bonhoeffer joining the Nazi party, some because they actually believed in the message, and others just for the sake of self-preservation. Right. And like we talked about with Bonhoeffer, if you're a pastor of a Lutheran church in Germany, you better be on board with the Nazis, or you're going to lose your pulpit, That and that'll be the least bad thing that happens to you, is right. that you're, you remove from your ministry. More than likely, you're going to end up jailed, like Bonhoeffer and others, Hans Ewand, and, and be taken to the gallows and executed. <clears throat> and so, you had, these are very serious life and death choices that you have to make. And it's easy, like yeah. you said, with Bonhoeffer to sit back now and armchair quarterback it. But the, the flip side is, like we talk about in, in, our, in the Lutheran side of the street, we call it in statu confessiones, meaning right. in a state of confession or taking a confessional stance, meaning I can say no, I can do no other. I, I can't not say something about this. And for Saze and Bonhoeffer, they had to speak up, hmm. which, uh, and that's why they're on banned books. Bonhoeffer is a banned books theologian for many reasons, actually. Right. And Saze is the same. Saze, after the war, had to leave his own country right. and go to Australia. Well, and he, he did have that intersection we talked about with uh, Bonhoeffer, uh, the Bethel Confession of, what was that, 1933? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so I guess he draft, he helped draft it, but didn't actually sign it. Right, and then and then didn't sign uh, Barman either. So well, he you know, definitely dif disagreed with Barman. Right, on, and it was a theological disagreement, not a, yes, not a practical one, trying to save his skin or something. Right. Well, this is one of Saze's key arguments here that I think, again, after the fact, we don't quite comprehend. Is Saze said specifically, but I'll paraphrase: just because there's a war going on doesn't mean we compromise our confession. Yeah, you don't compromise on doctrine to basically, what do you want to say, adapt to the conditions of the culture at the time. Well, and one of the things that um, that we're careful to do on the show is to recognize that what people mean by words isn't always the same. Right. And so, uh, what he recognized, if I remember right, from Bethel was that um, uh, when, like, a Lutheran and a Reform say that God works through word and sacrament, mm, yes, they don't actually mean the same thing, even right. though they both will agree to those same words. Right. And I mean, this is where I know it seems kind of, what do you want to say, nitpicky or something that, that you would get hung up on that. And it's like, well, we both believe that God works through word and sacrament. Isn't that enough? I'm like, well, the nature of that work and, and actually how does the Holy Spirit, you know, involved right. and, uh, but, and certainly what is word and sacrament? It, right. We don't actually fully agree on that. Right. And let's is, not. Either is means is or is means represents exactly. something else. Yeah. And therefore. But uh, guys like Saza and others throughout history will appeal to Jesus and Matthew, for example, mm -hmm. that you don't fear men who can destroy the body, but fear God who can destroy both body and, and soul and cast it in hell. Yeah. So get the and doctrine Peter's right. confession before the religious leaders. Mm -hmm. It's like, I serve the word of God. Sorry. You know, I can't, I don't, I don't, I'm not called to obey the word of men or the authority of men. I'm called to obey the authority of God and his word. And therefore, even in the face of persecution, even in the face of the Nazi party, I'm not going to compromise my confession <clears throat> because you can kill me, but that ain't going to change the fact that I'm a baptized child of God. Yeah. One trumps everything. So we thought then, as a consequence of the conversation with Bonhoeffer, we would dive into Saze too, who, for those of you listening, in my opinion, is the most Lutheran Lutheran of the 20th century. <laughs> like, if you really want to understand Lutheran theology in the 20th century, like really Reformation Lutheran theology, yeah. Saze is the high watermark. For me, who's also then the spiritual mentor of our spiritual father, Norman Nagel, right? Who translated a lot of Sazi's stuff. But I and, think, it, and uh, it, President Harrison too, and President Harrison, the president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, is that there are a few of us around that think that Sazi is about as Lutheran as it gets, and part of that is because he went to Australia, like I said, because mm -hmm. of the German Church and the German Lutheran Church, which really wasn't Lutheran. Uh, it was comprised of Reformed and Evangelical, non yeah, Especially and, after the war. Yeah. yeah, again, Evangelical Church in Germany, the Akehead. And he went to Australia where the Lutheran Church was completely fractured. And he solely basically united the Lutheran Church in Germany, you know, founded two seminaries? Uh, well, Adelaide is the primary one. Yeah. yeah, Adelaide. And then there was the offshoot, the second seminary that came out of that. Don't know. I can't remember. Again, it's early in the morning, I apologize. But uh, at least the, the seminary in Adelaide he founded. And 
now, actually, right now, at this very moment, that church that he brought together is split again. Mm -hmm. And has moved apart because the old pillars... Practically speaking, not not actually. Yeah, Yeah, of course, yeah. Not on paper, (laughs) but for all practical purposes, it's split. They have two different elections, basically, or two different voting periods. The pastors vote, and the people vote, and the... uh, the the people which way did it go i can't remember last time around every time mm. the, either way the way they vote on matters um uh, are in opposition at least on the more liberal matters so. right so you have this and and so saze has been vilified countless times and been declared mm-hmm. unkosher countless times by both lutheran and non lutheran the united states he's got a very contentious relationship with the lutheran church in the united states depending on which church body you talk to so he's definitely a banned books um what do you want to say? Character of the month. Yeah. And and also, I think, because we talked about the Nuremberg stuff, and uh, we were talking about this book on the Nuremberg chaplain that we definitely have to get to on this podcast too. But it, for myself anyways, it, it's interesting to go outside of the baseball stadium and see how theologians engage culture too, not just each other. And I think, I was reflecting on this this morning before we hit record, that when you go online and you look at a lot of arguments, theological arguments, it's just Christians beating Christians over the head with theology. (laughs) And it's so, so inside baseball that an onlooker, and even a Christian onlooker from outside one's church body, has almost no point of contact whatsoever with the conversation or the debate. And especially in the United States, we've had the privilege of not having to worry about things like what Saze and Bonhoeffer had to deal with. But that's changing to a certain extent also, (laughs) more and more by the day with everything that happens in the churches and with people attacking right. the church in different ways. Right. <clears throat> but I think it's an important point that, as we talk about a lot, balancing the two kingdoms, holding the two kingdoms in tension, both right and left-handed kingdom, kingdom of the earth and kingdom of heaven, but also, as we talked about in the Bondage of the Will episodes, the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of Christ, and not letting those slip. Yeah. And so for, for Sazi and Bonhoeffer, the National Socialist Party isn't just morally evil, It doesn't just represent bad governance. They're satanic. Mm -hmm. They're an instrument of Satan. They're an agent of Satan. Nazis are agents of Satan. This is satanic evil. So it does have more than just an earthly element to this. This isn't just left-handed kingdom stuff. This is also a matter of confession and salvation. And I I would say, you know, vocationally, Zasa did not leave, right, Germany. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he didn't abandon his people. If you right. want to put it that way, or his right. nation, um, he suffered it as long as he could. Right. Well, yeah, exactly. You stay until you can't anymore. Mm-hmm. So this is an excerpt from the Church Yearbook of 1932. And for those of you who are familiar with the rise of National Socialism, Saze was on point with this a long time before most other people were. And so this is from the Church Yearbook of 1932, and it was written to all of Germany, to Protestant Germany by Pastor Saze. So, Herman writes, the regression of the church in the present live lives of men. The regression of the church in the present lives of men is illustrated by nothing more so than the role which the great political powers play in our time. So, the regression of the church, the withdrawal of the church in the lives of people is illustrated more so than anything else by the way in which these political powers and what they do right now are doing and what people are doing with this or in response to it. Mm -hmm. So he says, no religious, no ecclesiastical question can move men of our day like the great political questions. Even the struggle between the church and the quote unquote free thinkers is for many, and certainly in no way only for the free thinkers. Finally, not a struggle of faith, but a struggle between political worldviews concerning the question whether religion should or should not be preserved as a necessary component of culture. Mm. 1932, folks, let me remind you. So this is prescient. Yeah. And we were talking about it before we went on air, but I mean, what is the role of, um, you know, political leaders, um, religion affiliation, right? Religious affiliation, but also that consequentially then his his morality or the way he lives. Yeah. Now, what what is the relationship of those two things? And I think of the way the founders, you know, spoke of that you you generally just need like a, a, you need a sense of decency and of at least of a deity or of a higher power. Right. For a 
you know, an American democracy to, to succeed. Right. <laughs> Believe in God, understand virtue ethics. Mm -hmm. And without that kind of baseline, um, the other principles of the country actually fall apart. Right, exactly. Yeah. Right. Hmm. It, you know, as an example, family is not hmm. a Christian doctrine. No. It, we have a doctrine of family, obviously. Sure, sure. But if you look at virtue ethics, there is a doctrine of society, and the family is the foundation of that society. Right. And you look at all the ways that um, our our government supports the family. Right. Very intentionally, whether it's, um, you know, universal schooling or, you know, tax incentives or mm -hmm. you know, uh, just other services. Why? Because without family, there's no more country. Right. Well, like Luther argued, without family, you don't get priests or politicians. Mm -mm. So, therefore, priests and politicians should not be placed above, above family as the most godly vocation. Mm. Because what came first? Priests, politicians, or parents? Right. And Luther said, well, obviously, Genesis 2 is pretty clear. Actually, Genesis 1 is actually very clear. Yeah, right, right. So, the controversy then between Protestantism and Catholicism is also completely encompassed by political issues. Mm. It appears the time is far behind us in which the unique questions of the faith were contested with any passion because they were perceived as the vital questions of humanity. An era like that of Athanasius, circa 296 to 373, is inconceivable to us in which the question of Christology literally moved the world. Yeah. Our era has scarcely any comprehension, even of the seriousness of with which men fought over the question of the faith in the century of the Reformation. That anyone would jeopardize the unity of the nation for the sake of the gospel? That the earthly happiness of entire generations could be sacrificed for them to retain the pure doctrine of the gospel? Who still understands this today? Hmm. In fact, the consequence of the 40 years war, 60 years war, 40 years war, 40? 30? 30. 30, thank you. Jeepers, I'm really <laughs> off this morning. 30 years war. Um, the consequence of that was, was as we've discussed in the past, whatever the religion of your ruler is, that's yeah. the religion of the country. We're not going to kill each other over the Lord's table anymore. No, We're done with that. So, if your prince wants to be Catholic, then you're Catholic. You're Catholic, exactly. Or you can move. Or you can move, that's right. Go to a Lutheran prince if you want to. You want to be under a, a Lutheran. So, yes, the consequence of the Reformation and, and being ready to die for the gospel, the Thirty Years' War, was then society said, you know what, let's not kill each other over the gospel. Well, the, the analogy um, is the split of the United Methodist Church. I don't know if you've been following this. <laughs> last week, yeah, so they agreed after la uh, last summer's vote, where mostly African bishops <laughs> voted against the mm, ordination sure. of homosexuals in yeah. particular, and also officiating homosexual um, marriages. Yeah. Well, so, but that didn't actually solve the problem. It just kind of kicked a can. Um, right. So now the, the more liberal faction that wants to do such things here in the U.S. said, okay, fine, we'll let you go. And you can have your property. We'll give you $25 million to establish your own church government. Hmm. And um, what's the other thing? Oh, and we'll even let you take your pension with you. Nice. Um. So, rather than continue to fight each other uh, and be united <laughs> mm -hmm. in name only, um, we'll just split. We'll yeah. just split. And you can go your way, we'll go our way. Um, and unfortunately, I think the African bishops are like, we can uh, we can save the American church, mm -hmm. the American Methodist church. Yeah. And the fact is, no, they don't want to be yeah, saved. Yeah, I saw the African bishop, bishops try that with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America at the, yeah, same story. Turn of the last turn of the last century there. Right. No, you just... I, yeah, it's like, in a sense, it's not your monkeys, not your circus. Right. I mean, I know it's the church, but uh, good luck influencing uh, right. Americans in this context. Um, right. You know, a liberal American that wants to go that direction. Uh, right. Spiritual blindness is spiritual blindness. Exactly. Yeah. So just go their own way. As an aside, if anyone wants to send $25 million to Gillespie and I to set up a new church governance, oh. we'll do it. <laughs> as long as we take our, what pension? Oh, well, anyway. I, I'm pretty sure I can carve a pension out twenty five million. <laughs> ah, I see. Yes, <laughs> I'll 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 make do. Really, you want to be schismatic like that <laughs> for twenty five million? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty it's sure. All about the money. <laughs> it's oh, all about terrible. the Benjamins. Oh, it's terrible. Cash rules everything around me. So, which evangelical church would dare today to render the decisions which Luther, in his struggles with the knights and peasants, the humanists and fanatics, had rendered? and which the Lutheran Church had confirmed 
when in the Augsburg Confession, 1530-31, it excluded Zwingli and the mystics from the fellowship of the evangelical church. Our opponents, as they're Our named. Opponents, yeah. yes. Even in the narrow cir- narrower circles of ecclesiastical life, dogmatic religious questions cannot attract the kind of interest which the questions of political worldview do. Mm. Today, wherever an internal ecclesiastical conflict arises over a doctrinal and confessional question, interest in the matter remains within a very small circle, as I noted with online social media arguments. (laughs) Nobody cares. Nobody cares. But the conflicts which extend into the realm of politics, such as the cases of Eckert and Gunther, oh, sorry, Eckert and Gunther Den in 1882, 1970, Again, there's a footnote some guys. We'll include. Yeah, some guys that will include foot, you know, we'll include the link in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Right. Stirred passions everywhere, like the case of Carl Jotho, or actually Jotho in German. Yeah. Once and, did. And the formation of groups and parties in the territorial churches and synods are more and more characterized by the questions of political worldview. If you want to see how this works in the present tense, a really obvious one is look at the church in Sweden. Mm, yeah. The government actually runs the church. And the government ordains pastors. And that, that works out okay, <laughs> uh, as long as the government are actually Christians. Well, I was going to say, as long as you actually agree with the political stance of the government, you're okay. Or the other way around, that the government agrees right. with the religious stance of the right. church. Which, that's why there's a lot of people who have left the church in Norway and Finland too, by the way. Sure. Uh, I was also thinking of uh, Massachusetts, for example, when it was founded mm-hmm. as a state. Yeah, right. Had a state church. Yeah, yeah, so our government didn't, I mean, the the, the uh, Republic didn't prohibit such things from a state. It just said the Republic's not going to establish a church. <laughs> mm, yeah. But the states yeah. were free to establish a state church. Uh, I, I don't know if there was another example. Maybe Rhode Island, Catholic? <laughs> Massachusetts sewer? Yeah. Yeah. That's I, what it was called, f- by the way. <laughs> there were a few, but they, um, they didn't last long. It's one of my favorite terms ever, Massachusetts sewer. But anyways, <laughs> I digress. Ah, uh, the good old days. Hmm. This process is happening even in the Stillen im Lande, the Christian Socialist Volksdienst, or how do you want to say that? Christian Socialist uh, People's Church, Folk yeah. Churches? Yeah, People's Basically, Service, really, right? Yeah, Folk Service, Dienst uh, Service. It's, how would we describe that today? Hmm. The, the Volksdienst. Um, this is, I don't know. There's a footnote, right? Buying a, a praise album on, a, on, on the internet and using it for your church service. <laughs> That's as close as I can think of. The Volksdienst were a conservative Protestant political party in the Weimar Republic. There we go. Oh, okay. So the, <laughs> were, this is the People's you Party. You were close, but not. <laughs> no, not even close. It's the People's Party. It's the People's Party, exactly. These, these, and, this, it's the liber- No, not the Libertarians. I don't no. know who this would be. I don't know. The Christian Socialist Volkstein. So these are the Christians. These are the Christian socialists who always tell you that socialism never worked in other countries because you didn't do it like they're doing it. There wasn't enough Christian in the socialism? Yeah. So we're doing socialism right because we've injected Christianity into it. Whereas the national socialists are wrong. Because they're taking Christianity out of it. Yes. Okay. Got it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Have sparked they so the Christian social Volksdienst and the notion the National Socialists have sparked passionate excitement in our Christian communities like no religious question since the Tongues Movement. Mm. Uh, do I really have to explain what the Tongues Movement was? <laughs> For those of you listening, the Tongues Movement they spoke in tongues. Right. The fact that today also within the church questions posed by the great political powers are the ones argued with real passion demonstrates like nothing else the strength of these powers. I mean, he, isn't he arguing here that um, nationalism has taken on a religious character? Yes, and it did under the Kaiser mm. back in the 1800s. So it becomes a religion. It, it, nat- yes, German nationalism becomes its own religion at a certain point. And then they co-opt Christianity yeah, to make it right. authentic or something. This is the Shire myth that Hitler, can, he hires all of these people to construct a myth, this Teutonic legend of the purity and the supremacy of the German race. Hmm. And so you take the tales of Teutonic Knights and Wagner's operas and Luther's writings against the Jews and all this other stuff, Dante, and you elevate these people as national treasures and then bring in their writings, twist them up so that they support your political view. And you vilify the Jews, for example. You vilify the black people and homosexuals. Again, all the quote-unquote perverts that are ruining our society. 
And now you have this myth that you've built up, this political religious myth that justifies getting these people off the streets and out of the country altogether, burning their synagogues, taking over their businesses, so forth and so on. And again, as I brought up in my sermon yesterday, who cares about baptism when there's bills to pay? Who cares about whether mm. I'm forgiven or not? In fact, when I got to put food on the table, who cares about coming to the Lord's table on Sunday when there's a new season of my favorite TV show on Netflix to watch? Yeah. Like there's stuff to do and there's not enough time to accomplish those things. And yet you want me to believe that coming to church Sunday after Sunday and listening to the same thing Sunday after Sunday and singing the same hymns and praying the same prayers and doing the same Bible studies over and over and over again. And by the way, it's been 20, 2020 years. Yeah, right. Which in God's time is two days, but nonetheless. Um, like that matters? No, that doesn't matter. What matters is that Trump is ruining our country. What matters is the the radical right uh, are trying to impose their restrictive, moral, white, supremacist, blah, 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 things on us, whatever the political platform is, right? Your politics du jour. Those are what really matter. Those are what make the biggest impact on my life. I know because the, the media told me. Well, and I thought this was interesting. I've had these conversations about, um, you know, how important is doctrine in the life of any individual yeah, right? in the church? And, you know, is it kind of a flippant statement, but basically, well, it really doesn't matter um, you know, about this, this or that, because the person is a Christian and mm -hmm. and a conservative Christian. So politically right. conservative Christian, that's what mm -hmm. actually matters. I'm like, really? How about like what the, what we learn, you know, from the scriptures or, or how we confess it in the small catechism? Isn't that really what matters? Isn't that really life and death? Not, right. not your conservative political affiliation? No. And uh, well, the answer was no, actually. Right. So, I, I wonder about the centrality of, you know, as he talked about with, Ath uh, was it Athanasius? Mm -hmm. You know, and the argument about, about doctrine being, you know, at the center of the life of the early church, their first few centuries, mm -hmm. and how now um, doctrine is almost irrelevant. You know, what's, no, actually, what's actually matters more is that we have a commonly agreed upon, oh, I don't know, service time and form. Social contract. And, yeah, exactly. That we agree yeah. to do this sort of thing. But what you actually say in the pulpit really isn't all that terribly important as long as I find it beneficial. Right. Well, because if I don't believe what you're saying, especially in the Midwest, if I don't believe what you're saying, I'll just nod and smile and ignore everything that you're saying. And then I'll complain about it on the way home. Right. Because what are you going to do to me? If you are you can excommunicate me or put me under church discipline, I'll just go find a different church. Right. And even if they're, <laughs> as we've both experienced, even if that church is a part of the same fellowship, they're right. not going to actually um, heed mm -mm. any of the warnings that you give or mm -mm. suggest that maybe your discipline is also binding there. Right. No, they're just going to no. say, well, great, we got another member. Finally. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So the politicization of the church, one, is always happening. It happened in the first right. century. Read right. the book of Acts. Right. Calling Jesus Lord, calling him Caesar is a big political statement. Or even like Paul with Jerusalem. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's always there. It's just a question of, are you going to mix the two or hold them at arm's length and keep the tension? Yeah. So Sazi continues, what does this process of politicization mean? What finally is happening with these powers? which today wrestle for rule in Germany and whose influence upon souls appears to be greater than the influence of the church. As philosophically based worldviews, the older of them came to exist in the first half of the previous century. Marxism and the great conservative and liberal democratic doctrines about society rose between 1830 and 1848 upon the debris of the great philosophical systems of the Enlightenment mm -hmm. and the classical period. And this is another, I think, important footnote to this is I've not encountered in my readings a better church historian yeah. who is better able to express church history in a very relevant and yet doesn't, he, in my opinion, he doesn't hijack church history to make his point, but rather he can see in church history because he's so well read and so knowledgeable about church history, he's able to pick those pockets and say, oh, we're doing it again. Here's an example. What's well, more than that um, is that the history of religion, the history of philosophy um, right. run in parallel. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you can't, I mean, you can't understand the trajectory of uh, religious belief, you know, and the fracturing of it, unless you also look at the, the parallel 
the things that are happening in the university mm -hmm. with the philosophy, you know, program. Right, absolutely. And so, I mean, because he just referred to that. He says, you know, the great conservative and liberal democratic doctrines of, about society, which is a not yeah. inadvertent turn of phrase there. Right. Calling them doctrines. Um, you know, it comes out of what happened because of the Enlightenment that it devastated, um, you know, the world. The right. way they thought about themselves and how right. they lived and how they lived towards one another. And, you know, this whole thing he's talking about, um, Germany having been primarily a religious, you know, eth ethical kind of society. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there were princes, but it was kind of a loose confederation right. of princes. And it was really about, like you said, what religion the prince had. That's what you, that's right. what you had after the Thirty Years' War. Uh, do we have a parallel? I mean, our country? I know we've talked about it. We're not really a Christian nation. No, and I was just going to bring that up. I, the difference is that those territories were tribal originally. Mm. And these literally going back to tribal chieftains and these tribes that Caesar tried to eradicate in his campaigns into Germany. So those boundaries are tribal boundaries, like in the Middle East today. We can draw up national boundaries, but the tribe is like, I'm reading a book right now, Under the Fire by Dakota Meyer. The, the Afghani villages along the Pakistani border, there's no Pakistani border. There's this tribe, and then on the other side of the mountain, that's where my cousin lives. Yeah. So someone comes along and says, well, your cousin's Pakistani and you're Afghani and you need these papers to get across the border. They're saying to you, mm, what? No, this is my tribe and this is the other side of my tribe. This is the other half. So, so in a tribe, um, politics and religion are, are intertwined. Of course. Yeah. Because why are you the tribal elder? Because the gods chose you. Mm, okay. Who's the shaman? The, he's chosen by the gods to be the oracle. This, the whole hierarchy within a tribe is that way because this is the way the gods have ordained it to be. And so that's like really bound up in this German identity. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's in Sasse's context. And that's this why, is why the Nazis yeah. use religion yes. as a political tool. And the legends, the Teutonic legends okay. and these myths. Right. Because these myths aren't just fairy tales to these people. Yes, they know they're fairy tales mm -hmm. and they're legends. They know this, like the Arthurian legends. No one's claiming that, oh, of course, this is a like binary one-to-one -one reality. It's history. But the German people identify with these legends and myths because this is what gives them a sense of place and meaning and, and identity. Belonging. Yeah. These are our myths and our legends and our history, you know, and it's like Wagner. He's ours. This is our music. This is our identity. We don't have that because we're an immigrant society in From this day one. Yeah. From day one. So we establish these, these artificial tribal boundaries when we get here. And then over time, we're assumed into the collective identity, which is no identity at all, technically, other than United States. Melting pot. Yeah. And so the United States is an incredibly uh, nationalistic country because we don't have necessarily those hard and fast tribal or historical tribal boundaries. Or religious and, ones. Or religious ones. And therefore, we, we say a pledge of allegiance to our flag. That's not normal for no. those of you listening. That's not a normal <laughs> practice for most countries. It's, it's a bit odd. Yeah. It is a bit odd. What does this flag <laughs> represent? Good yes. question. Right. Well, by the way, which goes into that whole religious political aspect, though, that the flag represents something in the same way that the sacraments represent something. Mm, okay. And now we have all of these symbols floating around that have these quasi-divine salvific meaning behind them. We do this. It's natural. It's human nature to do this. Well, and I think we even, at least in my experience, will co-opt God's word um, to somehow justify that too. So like, blessed is the nation that the trust well, in the course. Lord. I mean, you and I know in our hymn book anyways, and I know in the Methodist hymn book that I've seen, the older ones, there's a whole section. Patriotic songs? Patriotic songs, exactly. Exactly. Hmm. And so if you're a member of a church, maybe you do have a Memorial Day worship service. Veterans or, Day. Or a Veterans Day worship service. Or a Flag Day even. They used to have Flag Day worship services in some churches, many oh. churches. Oh, Okay. To show your patriotism, to show God and country. Oh, yeah, we talked about that with uh, flags in the sanctuary. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, yeah, this is nothing new. <laughs> it's just the, the level of fervor and how politicians and these political groups grasp upon these myths and these legends and these stories to basically say, are you part of our tribe? Hmm. You know, do you share our story? This is the, the beauty of Steve Jobs as a salesperson. Oh, right. Yeah. Steve Jobs knew that what he was selling you is the same basic hardware of all the other pieces of hardware that were on the market. Or even so he wasn't inferior. selling you 
Yeah, or even inferior. So he wasn't selling you hardware. He was selling you the why, as Simon Sinek calls it. Mm-hmm. Meaning, this is why you're going to buy this product. because it's, it's experiential. It's experiential. You want to be a part of this story. Mm-hmm. You want to be a part of our story. You want to be part of the Apple story, right? And now it's fallen into self-parody at this point. But at the time, this is why people line up at midnight to get a phone. And Apple doesn't care about you. I did and they it don't once. care that you bought their phone at midnight any more than when I was younger, you'd line no, up at midnight to get it. they gave me a high five it. after I paid for it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And all those kids in those sweatshops in China, thank you. And, <laughs> uh, nice call. You know, shout out to Ricky Gervais. Gervais. Um, 2020, baby. All right, dear listeners, like last week, we're going to cut the episode off right there and uh, come back later this week with the second half of the episode. This will make it a little bit easier for you to uh, listen to the whole the whole conversation, um, but also maybe give you some time to digest what you just heard. So tune back in in just a few days. <laughs> <laughs>